Hi everybody and welcome to tonight's meetup. We are having the 20th Glasgow is your user group um, and we definitely have come a long way since we formed in 2017. So thank you for supporting this. Um, I know these virtual events aren't quite the same as the in-person events, but hopefully we can keep the learning, the sharing and the growing together as a community going um, until we can get in-person events again. Um, Myself and Gregor um, are the user group um, founders and organisers. Um, so if there's any questions, any feedback, any issues at all, please do reach out to either of us. We're both on the chat tonight. So again, feel free to um, get in touch if you need to. With that in mind, I just want to highlight that we had have a code of conduct. Um, we expect everybody, um, attendees, speakers and sponsors to adhere to our code of conduct. And if anybody unfortunately isn't adhering to our code of conduct, please do let us know and myself and Gregor will investigate and deal with appropriately. Um, so yeah. Um, I want to highlight a couple of events that are happening in the community, um, further virtual events. Um, a speaker, Thomas, who came last year and spoke to us in person, is running this Cloud Identity Summit um, later in October. Um, it's going to be a virtual event and it looks quite good in terms of what he's offering and what speakers are lined up. So if you're into identity and Azure Active Directory, this is definitely an event to sign up for. Now tomorrow night, two of my colleagues, Jay and Zachary, are going to be doing a live stream on Twitch um, around um, Infrastructure as Code and Terraform. So definitely check out the guys. I think it's 7pm UK time or 2pm um, Eastern Standard if you're in the US. Um, but definitely check that out. As I said, it's going to be a live stream. So the guys are there and can um, ask your quest answer your question sorry, um, and get interactive as well with that. And lastly, before we start the talks tonight, I just want to give a big shout out to our sponsors and they thank you for all their support and continuing to support us even though we're virtual. It allows us to have these Teams meetings and it also allows us to give out the quiz prizes which we'll have at the end of tonight. So without further um, delay, I want to hand over to our first speaker, um, Derek, who is going to talk to us about Runbooks. Demo as well about Azure Automate as well. So uh, let's uh, what's on the agenda. Uh, brief interruption to me. I'm really sorry about that. I don't like doing it, but um, I'm Derek Campbell. Hello. Um, I'm a, a senior continuous delivery architect at Octopus. I've uh, been there for a couple of years now. Before that, I was a consultant, um, and I, I originally come from operations. So. Runbooks is actually something I've, I've been using in some form or another. Um, you know, used to be bits of paper. But we'll jump in, talk about what what is it, uh, Runbooks. Then we're going to give a quick demo on Azure Automate and why you should definitely use it as well. Um, and then we're going to do a, a, a demo. And then uh, I did, did say Q and Obviously, if you get any questions, great. If not, that's totally cool as well. Okay, so. Uh, what are runbooks? Uh, runbooks are the ops side of DevOps. They traditionally used to be bits of paper. You know, they used to maybe be uh, wikis or actual formal bits of paper. You had to sign, etc. You know, obviously do this, provision this server, add static IP, all that sort of good stuff. Uh, they've definitely evolved over time, and now uh, as uh, DevOps becomes more of a thing, uh, you, you can use them to automate routine configuration tasks maintenance and emergency operation tasks as well so think about like routine configuration would be configuring uh iis or uh, installing um or configuring a server with arm templates etc maintenance would be like your sql backup so that sort of good stuff in emergency when everything's went a little bit wrong uh so you may want to spin up say dr or fail something over at a load balancer level uh definitely obviously i use uh, Octopus Runbooks quite a lot for infrastructure provisioning. I actually have it all. I've got a home uh, lab with Hyper V 2019. I use it for provision uh, all my servers, and it's really cool because I, I'd set up a lot of home servers just for you know testing something and then destroying it. So you can use like uh, new VM and then all unattend XMLs and stuff like that. Um, and you can also use it for your dependency installation, like IIS, .NET. And then turning infrastructure on and off. I'll show you that tonight. It's funny because I, I get a lot of people who want to spin up infrastructure um, from scratch every day, but it's quite an undertaking. But at the same time, as is just turning it on off uh, at the end of the day and turning it back on. Uh, in Azure can give you something like a 65% saving uh, if you only use the VM or web apps, etc. Obviously, you can't 
uh, sorry, SQL servers, etc. You can't do it for web apps. Um, but yeah, database management, server updates, website uh, failover, restore from backups, spinning up DR, restarting services. And I've actually come across a, a particular use case for Octopus Runbooks where Octopus.com was having some problems. This is uh, not long after Runbooks actually came out. And Octopus.com was getting application gateway errors due to a third party. Uh, and we host everything in Azure. Uh, so I actually wrote a, a runbook to monitor and just check for a 200 response. <laughs> that was saying it was online because um, obviously our team is all, we all uh, work remotely. So what is actually quite interesting is, you know, obviously we have people who have certain access to production. And what I did is I managed to write a run book that restarted the web app because that always brought it back up. It was quick and dirty, but it just ran on a cron schedule, checked it for five minutes, waited for two minutes just to for any sort of transactions to complete and then restarted. Quite cool, but it, it was some time ago now. So why would you use run books? Well, to be honest, if you're using Octopus or even any sort of other deployment tool, then they do sit by side, uh, sit by side. The good thing with Octopus, if you are using it for deployment, it's already aware of your infrastructure. It's very discoverable. Uh, you've got that shared security. So if you're using Azure Active Directory or Active Directory on premise, um, you can still use that same integration. And one of the things that I like, and particularly coming from an operations where servers used to take, you know, three months, you know, you would put in that bit of paper for your, you know, someone would approve the server, you would go to Dell, you would, um, you know, have to rack it, get a static IP uh, for the remote management system, then a static IP for the OS, you would then install serve the latest server uh, edition, then install SQL or Oracle or IIS, etc. And it's funny because I did a webinar recently with uh, Paul Broadworth from Chocolate and I installed a VM from scratch with something like 23 applications. Uh, that's Kubernetes, Visual Studio, uh, SQL, everything really um and that you know took 29 minutes and it's funny because using using run books i was able to do that what used to take three months um and obviously a lot of that as well was but that was actually provisioning the virtual machine as well using arm templates and the good thing is is uh, we have a built-in community step template and the uh, custom step templates as run books so you can use a bunch of stuff there already as well they all come as part of octopus so run books versus deployments um the good thing the main thing here is you don't have to create a release uh that was run books has been about in some concept because effectively you know it's just scripts you're running right um and you had to create a release and then rerun it um, and then you know tag different machines this is just an improvement where you don't have to create a release you can run them in dev test you can actually scope run books to only be able to run in certain environments as well uh, and there are there are there are slight difference in rules and permissions uh, and the main thing here is any variables are shared uh, which is very handy so one of the things you have to do is when you're creating a run book you have to publish it uh, so what you do is you know you can do it run it on dev or an isolated environment and then publish it and you do need to uh, a draft needs to be tested first before you can publish it for use of triggers and users with that run book permission uh, and then you can specify custom retention policies as well and um, the good thing is as well is you can edit it um it's you know think about it like if, if, if you're a developer um or you're used to working you know say for instance think about it like source control you can um you can play with something run it until you get it right and then publish it which is effectively merging into master and you can get those environment scope run books and i'll show you some of those later and the good thing is is there's an api for that so you can run it from azure devops as well and um, you can run it from your you know anywhere as long as you've got access everything within octopus is is actually um available uh so yeah okay so octopus run books um lots of process automation it supports python powershell bash c sharp f sharp uh you've got configuration management uh desired state for instance change control you can also use um you can also use like az cli as well which is one of my new favorite tools at the moment um well i've been using it for a while but it's definitely using az interactive recently um and it's just i'm in love with it um you can also do your inventory management via octopus and another thing that I use it for is I use it on my local uh, servers for updates. You know, we've all been there. You use WSUS or 
uh, SCCM, um, a whole bunch of other tools that you can run. But what I do is I've, I've got a few Octopus servers and what I have is like a highly available configuration and, and I've got something like 25 VMs in the house um, at any one time. And what I do is I actually just use Octopus as the orchestrator for Windows updates, which is cool. You can also do it with group policy objects, but I've always found that a little bit, it's, it's difficult. Um, and then you can set it as set schedules. You can also do things like um, installing your chocolatey uh, packages, upgrading them as well. Uh, so it's super cool. Azure Automate, right? And obviously, Azure Automate is fantastic. If you're not using it, please go ahead and use it. Um, there's so many cool things it can do and it automates. And a lot of them, there is a lot of crossover between the two. Um, if you're not interested in, in, in Octopus Deploy, definitely jump onto Azure Automate. Um, with that, you can run Python scripts and PowerShell scripts. It does configuration management, desired state, change control, inventory uh, management as well. You can also do your updates. Uh, and I actually really like the updates. Uh, you can do not only just do, because one of the things that I hear a lot about uh, with Azure Automate is people just thinking that it only does Azure. That's, you can actually do it uh, on premise as well, which is really cool. And you can schedule them um, as well. Uh, so yeah. So what I just want to do just before I jump in is I just want to jump into uh, to Azure Automate. So one of the things is, is if you come in, you can obviously uh, it's Azure Automate runbooks. I really like this uh, overview, but for the most part, it, it's it's broken down into a few a few separate parts. You've got your configuration management, so that's things like your inventory. So today's servers actually have an Octopus Tentacle on them, but they're also registered uh, in here as well. So you, for instance, you can see that this is all uh, Windows that we're running. Um, the last time it was refreshed was well actually a minute ago, which is cool. Uh, you can see things like, um, you can actually see like things like the software. So there's, there's only 1,246 bits. So you can actually as well, you can do things with registry, Windows services, all that sort of good stuff. Um, Change tracking is really cool as well. Actually, you can see exactly what has changed. Uh, and you can, again here, this is where you can add your non-Azure machine as well. And you can go straight into log analytics. Um, so yeah, you can set that connection from, from in here. This is a state configuration. So this is where you, you know, if you're running through and something's drifted, you can address that there. Uh, update management, you, if you come in, you, you'll see here, is you can see your non-compliant, your compliant machines. So Derek has obviously not been upgrading SQL recently. Um, and that's something that you can come in and address really quickly. So you can actually schedule the update deployment. You can add, add additional Azure VMs. Again, really, I would look at adding your non, uh, particularly if you're using it in a hybrid environment. So what you've got here is you've got the version of what um, of Azure's version of it, and what you've got here is a whole bunch of uh, runbooks. So you can do so many things. So you've got Python runbooks, you've got uh, PowerShell runbooks, you've got graphical runbooks as well, and then PowerShell workflow. Uh, so for instance, you can actually see the workflow of that. Ah, oh, that's not a good one. You can see the workflow of this. So say for instance, I've got this here. Uh, actually, sorry. Oh. Actually, let's just skip past that part. So again, you've, you can see the jobs, schedule things as well. You can, you know, your modules and all that sort of good stuff. But yeah, definitely if you're not using, if you're using Azure, uh, even if you're not using Azure, actually having that centralized location where you can register your machines, definitely check this out. Okay, so let's jump into Octopus Runbooks. So this is, if you're familiar with the CI/CD pipeline, this is generally what most look like. And what I'd like to do is just kind of break down what today's, I've got a couple of demos that I'm going to run concurrently. Um, so I'll switch back and forth a little bit because we're going to be provisioning some infrastructure. We're going to be doing some DR stuff. Uh, so this is what it looks like. You've normally got a developer, they're on their laptop, check it into source control, Azure uh, repos, GitHub, etc. You've got your pipelines there that builds your code that runs a test creates artifacts or, or even hosts the artifacts and then pushes it over to octopus and octopus then goes ahead and uh, automatically deploys to development for instance you normally get a tester in there who go in and promotes things manually and then you've got the web admin you can also do this fully automated as well 
So just want to show, um, we've got OctoFX. OctoFX is a sample application that we run at Octopus to demonstrate deployments. But what we just want to do is just share the infrastructure that we're doing today. Uh, we've got a Bastion box. Uh, that's going to be doing the SQL development. You don't obviously want to open up your SQL to the, the, the web. Um, you've got a dev virtual machine, and then you've got a, a rate service box. What this means is, is you've got a front end facing website, you've got an underlying database, and then you've got a Windows service which runs on a third party and updates the effectively the, the uh, transactions uh, and the foreign exchange rate. Because OctoFX is a, it's a fictitious London based agency that trades um, on foreign exchange. Test is very much the same. Uh, you've got that front facing website, you've got the rate service, the database. Production's a little bit more complex, uh, but what you've got here is effectively a load balancer sitting in front. So you've got your traditional virtual machine, and then at the end, you've also got a rate service box as well. So just to uh, make it more production like, we also have disaster recovery. So as you can see, we've got dev test, pre prod, and production. So that will take us into today's, so you can see here, we've got down. Um, so this is Azure DevOps. I just want to skip over just to show this is not smoke and mirrors. This is something, uh, so there is a repo there. Uh, you can actually check this out. Uh, so if you ever want to check out Octopus Samples, Octa, OctoFX, you can have that. And then you can see that it's got anonymous authentication enabled as well. So you've got here, you've got a build, your typical build. Um, so just uh, so you just see her here. It's pulling down the repository. Um, if you're not from, if you're not using Azure DevOps or CI, then definitely check it out. It's fantastic. It makes things awesome. And Octopus actually has a uh, extension in there as well. So what we're doing here is um, we're using NuGet. We're building a solution. We're pushing it to Azure Artifacts, and then also pushing it to Octopus as well. Then from there, we've got we're creating a release. Uh, so just something to check out. You can jump in. You can see that we've created release. This was just earlier on today. Um, we've pushed this. We've created release within Octopus. We've deployed it to dev and then deployed it to test. So just to give you an idea, this is the application. So you can see here that at today at 10.58 a.m., I did a deployment uh, to development and then to test. Production was actually using a scheduled trigger, but you can also orchestrate that from here. But just want to get, just to give an idea. This is what you would do within a deployment. Um, and what I've got here is this is all went ahead. So everything's great here. You can also use, if you want to see any of these samples, you can actually go to samples.octopus.app in your browser. Please don't go there just now. Um, just one thing is if you start clicking about and there's lots of people on it, sometimes it slows down and it will slow down today's demo. But one thing is, is you've got your deployments and then you've got your operations. So what I just want to do quickly, I just want to show this, there is no smoke and mirrors. Um, so what we'll do is I write out the, the URL as part of a script using Markdown, mostly just because I'm lazy um, and I, I like being able to just click URLs. So you can see here, we've got this, I'm actually writing out the name of the server there we go. We've got we've got all this, and then lastly, actually, let's just uh, create this. It's uh, Octopus Samples dot com, and then just one last thing is we've got there we go. It's dr, not doctor. Octopus Samples, um, but yeah, you get the idea. So uh, let's have a quick look here. So you've got dev, you can see that's run, uh, sorry, test running on, um, you've got that running on a server. Just want to show you this. Uh, oh, looks like I haven't opened up the portal. So I just want to show you this within as well. So you can see here that disaster recovery is off. Uh, so we've got dev, we've got test, we've got uh, octopussamples.com. And then let's switch to yeah, Okay, so what I just want to show you quickly is just obviously the servers that we're running in today. So 
Uh, let's go to resource groups. And then, uh, I say no, yeah, I always, I don't know about you, but I always prefer the virtual machine um, and then using the filter from there so you can see everything. This does have context. So one of the things that you want to do is just select resource groups and then, okay. Got one here. Okay, here we go. So as you can see here, we've got a bunch of VMs uh, and then we've got some turned off as well. So you see here that the Bastion box or DRs off, uh, rate service box, DR web server, and then the SQL. So what I just want to show you just now is Runbooks. This is Runbooks. I know that was a, a little bit, took a little bit of time to get into, but this is where you configure all your goodness. So what you've got is, um, for instance, within Windows updates, it looks kind of similar to um, to a deployment process within Octopus. So this is just a script that runs. You can go in. Uh, I just want to show you. These are, so there we go. We just got a function. It just grabs a bunch of, you know, goes ahead and does Windows updates. And I use this machine. I use that for uh, my, uh, my, my home machines as well. This one, this is a really cool use case. Is quite often, um, one of the things that I really like about Octopus, is, uh, Octopus Runbooks is enable self self service. How often, you know, if you're if you're a developer, you know, and then if you're in operations, how often do you get that? I need a copy of the production database or vice versa. I need to restore it back to test. Um, you know, you want to maybe think one a further things to think about is restarting services app pools, etc. I'll show you that later. But this one, this one's quite cool. Um, and what it does do is it takes a backup of production and restores it back to dev, test, and then disaster recovery as well. One of the things that you can do, actually I'll show you that in just a minute. But see, for instance, obviously one thing, if you're, if you've personal identifiable information, definitely use a uh, data randomization tool like Redgate has. You don't want to be caught with, you want to have production like database and, and test because code tends to go forward, but data goes back. Uh, so often these meet um, in the middle and you can use triggers as well so you can automate that. So for instance, I'm using triggers so that every day test gets a, a refresh uh, dev gets updated weekly and every evening I'm actually spinning up disaster recovery, doing the new deployment of the code and then restoring the data as well. So that's something you can do with triggers. So you see here, we're backing up the database. We're actually uh, stopping uh, the app pool. We're then stopping the servers. We're doing the SQL restore. Again, you can look at all this live on oct uh, samples.octopus.app. You're adding the database uh, user, doing the restore, and at that point, you can then write out the restore URL. Um, again, that's just me being lazy because I don't like remembering URLs to test. So you've got some bits there. So actually, what we're going to do here is whilst we're doing that, I'm going to just select run. And then I'm going to take test. One cool thing, this is just a fairly new thing. Uh, so this is going to go and do a database restore to test from production. Whilst that's happening, uh, I just want to, uh, if you come in, you can actually under settings, one thing, because one of the things is, is you could effectively do a, rest a backup and then restore back to production. So what you can do is scope it to environments. You can, of course, do it to production, but, you know, if you're doing a test of your data, uh, then that's something to that you could just restore it and then take it back to production. Generally, not advisable because you'll probably take your website off. Line. But yeah, so that's going to happen. So let, I will come back to that. So you can see there, that's if you get under tasks, this task is running. So just to go back to projects, OctoFX, under runbooks. You've got things like install dependencies. I'm a huge fan of chocolatey. I'm sure you are too. But again, I think most of this, to be honest, most of the stuff that I've done is just 
because I'm lazy um, and I don't like doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, so what you can do is automate it. So chocolate is a, a package management um, tool that you can use to install things. So I'm doing things like ensuring chocolate is installed. I'm actually installing VS Code, .NET. I install VS Code everywhere because Notepad is not great. So I, I got, you know, obviously it might not be for everybody, but I can also do things like installing IIS and dependencies as well. So what I tend to do, I'm a big fan of doing something manually and then from there automating it. So run these scripts, write these scripts, and particularly if you come from an operations background, start using PowerShell. Start, you know, like your, those little tasks that you do, and that's, you know, start using PowerShell to automate some of that. So what you've got here, and again, you can actually source control this, is... We're installing bits here. So, for instance, we're installing IIS, uh, URL rewrite, all that sort of good stuff. And then lastly, we're deleting the default website because, again, that's that's something that I'm just not a huge fan of. Uh, and then lastly, this is actually one of my step templates that I wrote for, on the community library. It just checks for a restart and then does does that at the end, which is great. But obviously, we've done, um, we've already done that some time ago. Another one is, this is the one that I was showing you earlier on. This one, sorry, I was mentioning earlier on. This one is the one that checks the website. So it's a HTTP test, but what this is, is this just checks, and if it, it runs every 15 minutes, this is because it's just a, a demo. And we've got it that it, this only runs between a certain time frame as well. So one of the things is, as you'll see here, is, is you can actually configure the run condition to only run this on failure. Uh, so when this last one, then you can see here that I'm starting a bunch of, um, I'm starting everything in a resource group. And then I'm starting SQL, I'm sorry, I'm starting the web. And then lastly, I'm actually using AZCLI to do uh, a switch around. So I'm setting the DNS record uh, of www, sorry, or just octopussamples.com and then switching that around with the, the DR. Uh, so you can see here, we're just setting this, these variables and then running that. So what I'm going to do, whilst I take you through these other ones, let's just have a check. Um, the other ones are really great, but you can see here, we've got restart IIS app pool. You know, you get those, and that's where I think that I really like the self-service aspect, because what often happens is you can't give everybody access to production, but what you can do is give them access via a tool like this, where they can go in and can say let's restart this in test or production because there's a memory leak and you can use monitoring and webhooks and all sort of good stuff here so we've got here where you can also have it so that it starts environments like i was mentioning earlier on you'll save something like 65 percent of your hosting costs like if you obviously you don't want to probably turn off uh, production but you may production may be an internal application that you don't want available uh, for security reasons, uh, financial benefits, all that sort of stuff. And then you've got things like different services. You can stop the environments. Um, so what I just want to do just now is I just want to check this trigger. Because what I've got here is these all run. So for instance, updates, you know, I'm sure you're all aware with Patch Tuesday. In development, as soon as that's out, it's, it's patched. Then it goes to test and then a patch because one of the benefits here is, is a patch disaster recovery last. Because if production's hit by um, an issue, what you can do is um, fail over to, to disaster recovery. So the, again, Windows updates. This is checking the website. Uh, this is only between 7 and 6 p.m. At uh, 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. Then restoring data here. So this is actually, this does happen automatically. So every morning we restore the data. We can start dev and test and then production separately, so you have different schedules there. And then, yeah, so you've got all this here. So you can also do upgrade chocolatey, upgrade chocolatey apps. One tip I would give you is if you're ever upgrading, if you're using chocolatey, update, um, choco update all, uh, and then a confirmation, and that'll, and, uh, I use it, I actually use a Mac at the moment. I've got a new Dell XPS with i9, 64 gig of RAM coming. Um, but I use a VM for this, and what you can do is use choco chocolatey and just upgrade all your applications. A little bit of a side, but you can then use that as a, a run book as well. So let's have a quick look at restore. Let's have a look at the tasks because this may be running just now. 
And one thing just to be aware of is in production, you'll see that it's running on Octo FX Pro 2. This is because I'm using sticky sessions. Uh, so what you want to do is that's fine. So we're going to we're going to make it look like it failed. So let's come into a run book. We're going to come in and do stop IS app pool. Select here. We're going to run this in production and then published. Select run. And this is probably backwards for everybody thinking that you're deliberately taking down a website. We'll start runs though. Um, what you should find uh, is this should go offline. There we go. So, middle of the night, something goes offline, you're on call, and then what you can do is, I do have this on a trigger, but I'm just going to run it manually for now. So what you're going to do is select run. The time, if you think about it, um, so yeah, you, I've only configured this for disaster recovery. You don't want to run this for dev and test. So what you're going to see here is this is going to kick off and it's going to fail. So there we go, service unavailable, so it's not giving that 200 error. It will try a few times. You don't want to kick everything off in disaster recovery. Okay, so you see here what was now going to happen. Yes, it's going to provision a worker. And there we go. So it's now what it's going to do now is it's actually going to start up disaster recovery. And then it's going to start up uh, DR SQL. And then from there, it's then going to automatically fail over. <clears throat> There's a few tasks running some just now. And what I'm going to do is this does take some time. It takes about six minutes. So what I'm going to do as well is I'm going to show you another demo application. This is Trident. <clears throat> Trident is um, a demo application that I use to, to showcase spinning up infrastructure. One of the cool things I like is if you're doing deployments to dev and test, what you can do is tear down your infrastructure. Quite often, you know, you've got Tom the tester, he wants to come in, he wants to deploy the latest branch. You could use a process like this to do your infrastructure provisioning and also your deployment and then use a manual intervention and then destroy everything at the end. One of the benefits and one of the problems that I've saw actually is you often see false positives or false negatives on legacy servers that have had, you know, you go in and they've got X amount of SQL or X amount of applications, .NET, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And quite often you see false positives and false negatives. What you can do with Azure, ARM templates, .NET Core, et cetera, is provision your infrastructure clean every time. So what, what we've got is we have a run a run book step. So what this is going to do is actually going to come in and run a run book. So this is actually, this run an Octopus deploy run book. There's a lot of runs in there. So what you've got here is you've got the run book name and what it's going to do is create that it's then going to, you can set uh, manual interventions here. So for this, we're not running, we're only going to do a development. And then we're going to do a health check because we're creating infrastructure. So as we run it, run it, it's looking for deployment targets, but we don't have any just now. We're then going to deploy an Azure web app. And then from there, we want to test it and then destroy it. So whilst that's happening, I'm just going to come in and create a release. Oh, let's go changes. We create a new release. Come in. It's going. I'm going to do deploy to development or test, etc. And you, you know, this could be Tom the tester or um, you know someone a project manager who has to do something in um, you know a remote environment or something like that. So what's going to happen here is it's going to create the infrastructure. So this is actually going to hold off. So you can see here. Let's just have a look. Pop it over here. So we're loading up Octopus. So this is a, a task within a task. So what we've done here is we've got a, a run book, and I just want I just want to show you that quickly. We've got a run book that is using a mix of Azure PowerShell, CLI, 
uh, and arm term templates. To so yeah, we're spinning this up. Let's just have a quick look at the at the process. So this is just um, a lot of these are built in one. So what we're doing is ensuring that the web app resource group uh, exists. And if it doesn't, we're going to create it. Um, so there we go. Probably yep, yeah, some PowerShell. Then we're going to create the web app. So this is using an ARM template using some uh, some parameters. So you can see here, this is a full ARM template, and we're specifying the variables and the parameters here. We're then deploying an empty database, which is really cool. And then from there, we're going to register. At this point, Octopus needs to be aware of the server. So what we're doing here is we're adding the web app over the Octopus API. So what we've got is a PowerShell script that is using uh, some API keys as parameters, the this, this URL. It's then calling back to itself and register, you know, it's registering uh, within itself. From here, you're then doing some bits with databases, creating the SQL user, creating the database user, and all that sort of stuff. So we've got this, and this can be run on dev, test, and, and production. Okay, so let's see. So there we go. It's actually created the infrastructure here. You can specify that the Trident Samples web app has been created. Um, and then what it's doing now is it's going to continue on, and then it's deploying the web app. So we'll give it a second. Uh, I'm going to just switch back to this. Uh, so what we've got now is we're back to OctoFX. So this is the one that is, has fallen over in production. You failed it over to a different region in, in, Octo in, sorry, in Azure. And then what it's then done is it's then used AZCLI and then updated. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a full, there we go. We'll make sure that this is running. There you go. And you can see here that production is now running in disaster recovery. Let's close that off. So one of the things that you can do as well, so everything's working great. You're going to come in, you've fixed the problem. The, the, the main thing here that I like is, I've done, I think I've done something like 12 years of on-call, and I love the challenge of it, but I can't say the reality of it was any great. You know, like, it kind of buys back my Friday night. If you can fix in production, then you can get up in the morning and, and switch it back. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. Let's just do start the app pool. So we're going to do this in production, and then select run. So we've done the opposite here. That pool should come up. One of the key things with Runbooks is effectively, if you can script it, you can effectively do it via Runbook, um, which is really cool. So we should see this working soon. Okay. Oh, that's happening. What we've got in here, there we go. We've deployed our, our web app. And then what you will have to do, so just um, let's have a look at the overview. Let's have a look. So what we've done here is we've run a run, uh, run a run book. It feels like run, run, rabbit, run, rabbit, run, run, run. Anyway, so You've got there, you've created everything, you've created the entire infrastructure um, stack, uh, stack from scratch. You've, you know, you've went here, you've deployed the web app, you've uh, you've got manual intervention, you load it up in your web browser, you can do your regression testing, you can tick it off. At that point, you say, assign to me, and then it's like, proceed. And then at that point, it's going to do another runbook. <laughs> it's, it's a bit like Inception. Um, it's going to do, because you can also chain runbooks, but that's that's something else. So at that point now, for the Trident app, we're then going to go ahead and destroy the infrastructure as well. So there we go. Let's run another runbook. It's going to just destroy the database, the resource group, everything contained in it. So that's the there for the Trident app. So yeah, we've got app pool for production back. What we can then do is we've got 
the opposite of what happens here is we're going to do so you come in on the, mon uh, on the Monday or the, you know, the next day you select run you can select production select there we go so we select this at this point it's then going to run the uh, it's going to actually it's just a an AZ CLI script and it's going to tell us your DNS to fail over from disaster recovery to production so this is the, the previous one. Okay. Let's just make sure this is all run good. This is went run well. Let's close some of dev and test. We don't need that. Okay. So what we're just going to do is we're just going to bring up DNS. There we go. So what you've got here is there we go. So you've got the www. So that's fifty-one. So dot one three three. What you do? This is Trident. Let's close that. Uh, so let's go back to the run book. And then manual failover to primary. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Select the process. I just wanted to show you. So the 133 app is, I've got it here in the script. 133 is the disaster recovery IP. And then 159 is the primary. So we're going to task. There we go. So we've run it. That's what we should see is. Actually, we just should uh, refresh. There we go. Went to back to 159. That was previously 133. We're going to want to do a full refresh. Let's bring this up. And there we go. We're back to Prod2. Uh, so what we've got here is one of the things I just want to show you beforehand is um, obviously this has failed, but this is deliberately failed because of the, the way it's set up. Uh, and one of the things that I did do just beforehand is we can come in and see that we have done a restore. So we should see that this works. It's, yeah, we go. We've done a, a full database refresh. Honestly, no smokes and mirrors. You've got done here where we have actually connected to production. We've just, um, backed up the database. We are then stopping the fx server we're stopping the windows service we're restoring the database here so you can see where the files are went to bastion went through and then ran through and update all the database and then from there we have a working website so from there we've got that let's close all this off um yeah okay so that's Towards the end of my uh, demo here, um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take just a moment uh, just to encourage people to talk uh, or if you don't feel like talking, to encourage other people. And <clears throat> imposter syndrome is something that a lot of people get. Uh, I've had it in the past. I, I still sometimes struggle with it. Um, the, what helps me is being open about it and talking about it. Um, and... One of the, what I've done is I, I spoke about it with uh, partners, friends, colleagues. You know, if you can't, one of the things I'd say, if you can't speak about it in front of your colleagues, then you, then it may be a, that's probably a, another problem. But be open, try and talk to your colleagues about it. Um, one of the big things I can say here is try and mentally reinforce yourself. You don't realise how much you know about something. Uh, often and to be honest as well in today's society where information is so easily accessible it feels like everybody knows everything and they don't um, and that takes me to my next point it's okay not to know something if you can you know there's loads of stuff out there there's great resources that you can go out google it to be honest I've been there in the past and one of the things there that I've done is really don't obsess about perfection um, quite often good enough is you know is the way forward and fake it until you make it um i like this one mostly just because i've been in a situation in the past where i worked at a technical agency and i was still a kind of sysadmin and 
I went in, into a large organisation and we had like a few other people and they all pulled out. There was a couple of people, unfortunately, who were sick and then last things propped up. So I went into this large un- London company and their IT department was larger than the company I worked for. And the company I worked for had about 80 people. Um, and I went in, these were all Oracle DBAs and I was terrified. I went in with an iPad and I was absolutely terrified. And then by the end of it, Everybody was happy with a clear plan of what we were doing with SQL. And it's, then I felt, I left that room feeling like a million pounds. And it was like, wait a minute, that really helped reinforce. So sometimes just putting yourself out there really helps. If you can, give speaking a chance. Um, if it's not for you, that's cool. Some people are bloggers. Some people just don't want to do that sort of thing as well. But, and that's cool. Um, try and, you know, maybe be a mentor or something like that at work. Um share information that you know i think as well we t- used to always be you know knowledge is power now being open and, and sharing knowledge is power um but one thing is is if you know anybody who uh who wants to give speaking a chance please 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 encourage them to do so spend some time with them um from there anything you can do really to, to help encourage that's always great and there's also really great people out there, like greg or sarah um, I've spoken with them in the past. I've spoken with a load of other people. And honestly, there's great, there's really great support out there. Um, one thing I would like to say as well, just to kind of tie up, is compare yourself to your yesterday, not someone's to, else's today. Well, not all Scott Hanselman or Troy Hahn or you know super popular techies, um, you know, and as well as that, often. I know I remember thinking about it. Some people, you know, 20, 25 years experience on you uh, and makes you feel terrible. So what I would say is set objectives, try and spend some time to do some learning. Um, one of the big things I do, particularly for operations, if you're, you know, obviously one thing I would like to say, if you're taking anything away from this, is start scripting. Um, start from there, start writing out PowerShell. From there, you can then really, really push out and automate those tasks. One of the things, I, I kind of started out in operations about 15 years ago in a help desk, and bit by bit, I kind of started automating the the, 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 the bits of my day away. Um, you know, for instance, installing IIS is only so interesting. Um, you know, until when you've done it for the 20th time, it's like, and that's one of the biggest things that Runbooks and um, Azure Automate really do help with is quite often that's when errors come in. And traditionally, that's what Runbooks were really built to stop. But the thing is, is the run books, you know, and pass them back between teams and, and having paper or spreadsheets or websites. And it's almost kind of a way to penalise if you forgot. But people do operate that way sometimes where their brain switches off. Whereas if you can use automated approaches, you'll get a much better engagement. And you won't automate your job away. What you're going to do is you're going to automate the, the tasks that make your job difficult and allow you to then keep systems up and then learn the new stuff. Okay, is there any questions? That was awesome, Derek. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, um, please take advantage of Derek being here and ask him any questions. Um, um, just one last thing. Obviously, if you don't think of any questions, I'm DevOps Derek on Twitter. Um, Actually, one of the things, um, I've started a YouTube channel called DevOps Derek. I had the, the benefit of Gregor. Um, I attend him. We're talking about uh, Azure exams. Sarah's going to be joining me in a couple of weeks as well. Um, but, yeah, um, honestly, thank you for that. It doesn't look like we've got any questions, so I'll pass it back to you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Derek. Um, Mikhail, do you want to start off your presentation? Are you there, Mikhail? We can't hear you if you're on mute. I'm sorry. Can you hear it's me okay. now? Yeah, I yes. can hear you now. OK, perfect. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Yes. This should be on now. Can you hear it or can you see it? 
Yep, we can see your slides. Yep. OK, perfect. So let's start. So hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Derek, for, for a great first session, and especially the last part about encouraging everyone to speak. I 100% I agree and uh, ready to help everyone uh, if they are struggling with their first talk or something like that. But uh, the subject of my own talk today is uh, Columius, which is a tool to manage your Azure resources with uh, desired state configuration, and everything like that. So I'm going to explain all of this during the session. But uh, to start, just a short personal story, how I come to this place. Um, so my talk uh, is sort of in the DevOps world, but I am not operations guy or I'm not DevOps guy. At least I haven't been. I've always been an application developer, so mostly like web applications and web services and data processing systems. And of course, I worked in like small DevOps teams in the past where the, the, we would have some IT people, operations people, and together we would. Mikhail, I think we've lost your sound. I think I can't hear you and a few other people are saying it as well. Can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear you. Oh, I switched the mic. I'm not sure what's going on with the other one. No worries. OK, where did you lose me? Just, um, just. I think just before you change slide there, I think for me that's when it lost. OK, so basically we were switching our applications from, from on-premises to Azure Cloud and uh, migrating from just virtual machines to managed services of, of Azure. And what happened is that we started using a lot of uh, different services and uh, like uh, databases, queues, storage, apps, uh, app service uh, and whatnot. And our applications got more and more components, so it was harder and harder to manage uh, in some sense. Also, like we tried, we tried to do everything right. So we did all the automation stuff, all the testing stuff. And we also tried to describe our infrastructures as code using our templates. So. We did that, but I remember that just for one application, which was nothing really groundbreaking, just a bunch of web applications and services and databases, we had like 5,000 lines of ARM templates that we had to automate, uh, to, to write to, to automate provision of our infrastructure. And the whole experience of ARM templates was great in some sense that the, you get the uh, repetitive deployments in multiple environments and whatnot. But writing those JSON files was quite miserable, honestly. So I thought there must be a different way. And uh, uh, long story short, a couple of years later, I'm working uh, on a tool which does sort of the same stuff, but using much more uh, developer-friendly approaches, which I'm going to describe. So um, now I'm working uh, at Pulumi. Uh, Pulumi is an open source tool to, to provision infrastructure in the cloud. Uh, just a bit more formal. Um, I'm a software engineer at Pulumi. Um, my mindset is more towards managed services and serverless stuff. Also, I'm a big fan of functional programming in F-sharp, but I'm not going to touch on this uh, today. 
if you have any questions after the session, you can always reach out to me on Twitter or on this email that you see on the slide. I will also share the links in the end. So I want to start with a more like general view of my own uh, on the cloud evolution. So cloud started like 10 years ago from simply migrating virtual machines to the cloud. So it's all infrastructure as a service, AWS first, then Azure and uh, Google later on. All the migrations to the cloud usually were like lift and shift. You, you took your existing VMs or physical machines and then just deployed the same in the cloud. And migration would be a project which runs for a year. You, you, you are done. You create all the resources in the portal or whatnot or with PowerShell. And then it kind of finished and then uh, again, it exists for many years. Today, uh, every cloud has like hundreds of managed services or at least hundreds of different resource types to manage. So you can create much more diverse uh, uh, landscape of applications. And also, as you know, there is some notion of cloud native applications. Everyone understands their own thing about that, but something like using container orchestrations or serverless applications or fully managed services in Azure, and you end up with much more fine grained and much uh, larger amount of components in your applications that, that were designed specifically to run in the cloud. And I think that that's great. You can take advantage of all the specialized services. But I also think that that's not the end game. In the future, there will be some sort of convergence of those services to focus on more specific application workloads and to target applications more, uh, application developers more uh, natively, let's say. Uh, I like the, the, the term that uh, comes from like Berkeley paper that the cloud is the most powerful computer ever. Like we need to find a way to exploit it to, to the full extent. So the, the conclusion here is that cloud needs to find a way which would be attractive for application developers and operations at the same time. So that's that's our vision at Polymi. And Polymi is a tool that allows you to manage your cloud resources with general purpose programming languages. So at the moment we support four runtimes, Node.js with JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, Go, and .NET with all .NET languages. Uh, I had to pick one for, for today's presentation. I picked uh, .NET and C Sharp in particular because I assume that's the most natural choice for Azure folks, but also because I'm working on those tools uh, in Polymer and I would know them the best. But everything that I'm going to say applies to all the runtimes that, that are on the screen. And also in, in your company, if some people prefer Python over, let's say, your C sharp, you can use both in the same uh, set of infrastructure. Uh, also, Pulumi is a multi provider tool, so we are on Azure Meetup, so I'll, I'll show all the examples in Azure, but you should know that we also support AWS, GCP, and so on. And also, things which are not really cloud providers, but still have a notion of resources. For example, from the same program, you can manage an AKS cluster, you can uh, create a container registry, you can create a Docker image, you can put your, that image into the registry and then create some Kubernetes objects that would use those uh, images from the registry, all from the same program or same set of program, which is very powerful. Now I want to jump ahead and uh, show you the demo so that you understand what I'm talking about. So Polymer is a CLI tool. Uh, uh, I have created an empty folder. Well, I think it's not empty. It contains some files that I want to deploy as a static website in the root folder. But for the rest, it's an empty folder. And to get started, I need to uh, run Pulumi uh, command, Pulumi new. Pulumi is a uh, CLI tool that I installed obviously before the session. And then I have to select some sort of template. This time I pick Azure C Sharp. That's a combination I'm going to use some defaults uh, for the questions. And then it goes ahead and creates a project for me. So a C Sharp project uh, in this folder. After it's done, uh, it says I'm ready to go. I can run uh, Rider ID, which is an ID from JetBrains. You can use Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, whatever. And if it runs somewhere, here. 
from all. Okay. That's not my project. Sorry for all the windows, but uh, finally I have this new project open. And uh, once it loads, do, 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 do. Uh, you will see that that's a simple .NET project. So it has a C sharp uh, project file there and two C sharp files, program.cs and mystack.cs. Program means that that's just a console application as uh, any other console application in the .NET world. And it's a very simple one. It just runs the de deployment, run async, and passes my stack to it. And then all the resources that I want to deploy to Azure should be defined here. I'll just go ahead and clean everything up so that it doesn't confuse us. So it's a class in C sharp, and then I have some snippets prepared to populate uh, the resource definitions. Uh, I want to deploy a static website, so I want to deploy a resource group, a storage account, and some uh, globs to that storage account. I can obviously import the namespaces. So this, this is how Polymer work program looks like. You create new objects with just C sharp or maybe Node, Python, Go. And every object defines one resource in uh, Azure. So in this short snippet, I define two objects, two resources in Azure. One is a resource group, a container, and then an account, search account inside that resource group. Now, the next snippet is going to be uh, iterating through the folder that I have on my disk. I want to deploy every file from that folder as a separate object in uh, Azure. And you can see that this, this is just plain C sharp file, so I can do everything I want here. I can import some NuGet packages if I want. I can use standard library for like file manipulations. And that's why it's much more powerful than like declarative, more declarative syntax uh, of like JSON or YAML or, or whatnot. And then, sorry, that's a long one. Then inside that loop, I create a blob object, which is another resource type. It basically uploads a file from the disk with a given name to Azure Storage account. And then the final step that I need to make in my program is uh, to export the URL of my website from the program. Because I don't know it in advance, Azure is going to assign it automatically when I run the program. I know that the storage account has a, a property called primary web endpoint, so I need to export it by assigning it to a special property in my class with an attribute output. So this is done, my program is done. Now I should go back to, not to the slides, but to boop, 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 the terminal. And now in order to deploy this program, I don't just run it, as I'm gonna explain a bit later why, but I need to run the CLI again, pulling me up. And when it does, it compiles my program, it runs my uh, console application and the result of the execution of the console application is not that the commands are issued to Azure immediately. It, the application just creates the definition of resources that I want to create. So my program is done and now I only see the preview of what I'm going to make. This preview shows the resources that I'm going to deploy or create. It says it's going to deploy four resources, a resource group account and two blobs, which makes sense. So now I can say yes. And at this point, my program will actually run again, but this time the uh, constructor calls are going to be converted to actual Azure API calls. And for every resource, there's going to be a resource created in Azure this time. So it knows the the right order of those resources uh, just because the way the way I used the variables in my programs, it knows that I have to create a resource group first. Then when a resource group is created, it can use its name to populate an account. So it can start creating a storage account. And once the storage account is created, I can also uh, go ahead. Well, well, the CLI can also go ahead and de deploy two blobs to the storage account. Well, that's done and files are hopefully uh, updated pretty fast, yes. And in the end, I get the output of my program as asked. Uh, so that's the URL of the website. And you can see that uh, the website is deployed, and that's my index.html file from the disk. Now, to make it a little bit more interesting, maybe I will change something in the in the uh, program. Let's say something like adding a new tag. Uh, I say 
environment it's production well it's not production but I'm probably missing some C sharp syntax here and you can see that while I'm typing I get all the benefits of uh, like IDEs I get IntelliSense I get uh, if I mistype something I will get some threads quickly and the feedback is pretty fast and I can immediately see any mistakes that I make. So in this case, I added text to storage account. So if I switch back and run the program again, now Palumi will compare the previous state of deployment with my new program and will calculate all the differences and show me the preview of what, what's about to happen again without actually making those changes first. And it says that I changed my storage account. And you can see that difference is just text, but it also thinks like well, maybe if I change the text, maybe Azure is going to assign a new URL. So it says that probably endpoint can also change, but in fact, it, we know that it, uh, it will not change, but there is no way to know uh, this in advance. So if I run it again, the only change is gonna, that's going to be made is updating text of my storage account. So my files are still going to be there. And this is hopefully a simple operation, so it's going to complete pretty fast. And you can see it's going to as it goes. Yeah. So that's done. So that's the idea of the of the tool. And I'm going to switch back to the slides and sort of explain more of the theory of how this works and uh, sort of beside behind the scenes view. So. Azure has a great thing called Azure Resource Manager. And Azure Resource Manager is not those templates that you know, but it's an API. And it has API endpoints for every service in Azure. Every time you want to create a resource in Azure, be it with Portal or with a CLI or SDK or third-party tool like Pulumi, you're going to hit in the end that same endpoint of the management API. So in some sense, all the tools are uh, similar in their capabilities, but they all, in the end, call the same endpoints. In in Azure. Now, more traditional ways there are, of course, is the case for well, for all the languages, including C sharp. So you could write program like this, which creates a storage account similar to what we've done. But the difference is that uh, SDKs they target endpoints directly. Every time you call this program, it will try to create a new storage account, even if it exists or if I change the text, it's going to be trying to do the same operation as the program uh, executes, which is different from Polymer as I'm going to explain. Also, maybe you're, you are using AZ CLI tool, which is great for some ad hoc operations, uh, more ops friendly than writing C sharp code, maybe, but it has their, its downside as well. So, uh, both as the case and scripting have a number of challenges for, especially for larger projects. First, they are imperative. So, you describe step by step what you need to do instead of describing what the end result should be. So that's fine for, for simple first time projects, but when you have a pro, an environment which lives for many years and it changes in subtle ways, you start writing a lot of update scripts from state A to state B and then maintaining them across multiple environments. That's gets very complex very soon and also error prone. So if your script fails somewhere in between, you don't really know if you can run it again and then it completes or it will create duplicate resources. It's hard to test for all the failure scenarios. So it's very uh, low level and uh, prone to different complications. So instead, long time ago, the idea of desired state configuration tooling appeared. And for desired state configuration, you only describe the target state of your environment. So you don't say this change from state A to state B, you say which state B should be. And you always operate uh, with the target state. And then there is a tool which knows how to interpret that definition of yours and apply it to any possible current uh, state of the environment. So if your environment is empty, it will create all the resources. If it's exactly the same as the target, it will do nothing and everything in between. And it's useful to reason about those things as graphs of resources. So your target state is a graph of resources with dependencies between them, what depends on what. And the current state is also a graph, which might be different, might be the same. And the nodes here are resources in the cloud and edges or errors here are dependencies. Dependencies are important to figure out the order of execution and uh, the consistence of, let's say, 
deleting one resource on, on other resources potentially. So when we look at this Polymer program that I showed you before, which create, defines two resources, it doesn't issue the commands directly. The result of the execution of this program is still desired state configuration, so it's still declarative in some sense. When we run it, we don't immediately create resources. We just describe that graph that I just explained you before. And then there is this nice, nice picture. Polymer uh, consists of multiple components. One component is your program that you describe, and obviously it's dependent on the language that you use. So in this case, but there is a host which knows how to compile .NET programs and execute them. And the result of that execution is the graph and set of commands to create a graph of resources. Then there is a CLI, which also contains the engine, and that's why I had to run it in order to deploy. That's the brain of the whole deployment. It knows how to compare your target state with the previously deployed state and figure out the difference, of the, the exact sequence of commands to execute. And then there are providers, in our case, that's Azure provider, which is sort of dumb thing. It knows how to create and delete and update resources, but it doesn't know about dependencies or, or anything. That all sits inside the engine. And the desired state configuration, you're probably very familiar with it already. If you know Azure RM templates, uh, they use JSON to describe the desired conf state configuration. Kubernetes is very popular, partially because it has built-in desired state in some deep inside the engine. So all the time you write some YAML uh, configuration files, and then Kubernetes internal control loop makes uh, makes makes it so that those those objects are always deployed and up to date. And maybe you know now Terraform as well, which has their own language to define resources. Now, the markup languages are good to get started, but once you get to like hundreds or thousands of resources, they are quite hard to manage. So from day one, they don't have a great tooling. Uh, Azure invests a lot of effort to create tooling for ARM templates, but it's still arguably worse than, say, Visual Studio for C-Sharp. Also, it's pretty hard to discover and uh, reuse the work of other people. Like usually, it's more or less copy-pasting from examples online to your program and make, changing them until it works and does what you want. Uh, and the sheer size, because the level of uh, JSON or YAML definitions is still pretty low level, it matches one-on-one -on -one to API definition, the size of those uh, resulting files is pretty big and hard to manage uh, over time. So just, just a quick example in my favorite space of serverless. Uh, I compared several several implementations of the same application of URL shortener, like bit.ly or aka.ms or whatnot, where you just go to a short URL and it redirects you to another URL in, in different implementations. Like to, to write this in, in C-sharp, you need about 20 lines of code to just read and enter from the key value store and then redirect uh, the user. But to define all the resources that you need, either in Azure or in AWS or anywhere, you need around like order of magnitude more JSON or YAML files. And this obviously doesn't feel right to a developer because you have to write 10 times more JSON than C sharp code while you, you want to do it the other way around. So one of the strengths of, of Pulumi as a platform is that you can start Porting your architecture to your infrastructure definition code. You can create higher level abstractions as just classes in C sharp and then make them re reusable. You can put them in reusable NuGet packages, share with your team or with large communities, and sort of bring your thinking of uh, high level blocks inside your code and uh, your diagrams start looking more or less like your code, which is always beneficial. So, a simple example again for measure functions from serverless. In order to deploy an Azure function, you need five resources. You need the function app, uh, service plan, a consumption plan, storage account is required for, for internal needs, but also if you want to deploy your zip to the storage account, you also create a container and develop uh, inside that container. So five resources plus resource group. Again, about 150 lines of JSON file. Now, in uh, Pulumi, you can go and create a component to do all of that, I called it in this case archive function because it deploys an archive of uh, 
uh, binaries into the function app, but your resulting program can look like five lines of code. You create a resource group, and then you instantiate that uh, component, give it a name, and point it to a folder on your disk, and that's about it. That's all you need to define in the program. Then you run pull me up, and you get something like this. You will see the preview of all the components that it, it's about to create. Of course, you still need to understand what you are doing and like what those components are. At least you don't have to repeat yourself again and again and again. And it will deploy all of those. And now you can make that component as simple or as complex uh, as, as needed. You can add extra options. So in the previous example, my uh, code, my actual Azure Functions code was uh, .NET. And by default, it will deploy it without any extra options. But I can say runtime is Node if my code is JavaScript pointed to, to a different folder and that's it. The component will figure out which application settings it has to set and like what changes maybe in other places of the resource it has to make. It's just simple, could be even like an enumeration in C instead of a string. If I say I want to deploy Python Azure function, that's a bit more complicated because I have to deploy it to Linux. It doesn't work in Windows. So I can create a separate uh, plan uh, app service plan in Azure with a separate resource definition, say that that's a Linux dynamic plan consumption or whatnot. And then the next step is an extra option in my archive function app where I can pass the plan. And if I didn't do this, the component creates its own or uses the, the default consumption one. But if I pass it explicitly, it knows our, because that's just C sharp. So there is probably an if statement somewhere there, which uh, says that if the plan is passed specifically, don't create a new one, but use that one. So the component is quite flexible, but still it's like 10 lines of code to deploy all, all this program. And uh, of course, while, while doing so, like this example again speaks for .NET, if you're using different runtime, everything applies here. You can run it on every supported uh, OS with any language that is supported, every IDE that you love or not. You get things like refactoring and uh, linking and the dog do generation automatically. You use package managers, and also you can do unit testing that I'm going to show in just a, a second. So because that's that's code, you can not only test programs by deploying them, which is useful, of course, but you can also have a must fa much faster and more uh, like detailed loop with unit testing if you want. Uh, it's just C sharp code in the end. So in, there is an ability for every runtime to mock the engine. So instead of deploying the resources, you say, I want to mock it. And then in C sharp, it looks like something like that. You have a method called deployment test async instead of run async. And then you pass your class that we defined before called my stack. And instead of deploying it, it will just run it and give you back the definition of that resource graph because. That's what the result of the program execution actually is. And now you can do with this resource graph anything you want. You can start inspecting its shapes. If you can check which resources are there, like in this example, I, I checked that I have tags on my resource group, but it can be as complicated or as simple as you want. And this will run in like several milliseconds because there is no real work going on here. It's just an execution and graph inspection. You can sort of create tests like this. This is TypeScript, just, just I didn't convert it to C sharp, but uh, it doesn't matter. This thing checks that for my Cosmos DB account, I deployed to multiple locations and there is at least 500 kilometers between these locations. So how it works, it loads the locations of Azure regions and then calculates the distance between them. You may want this for like disaster recovery policies or whatnot. It's just an illustration that you can do anything that uh, general purpose program language can do in your unit tests and do it very simply in just several lines of code. Uh, yeah, that's just a screenshot of the blog post. If you're interested in go in learning about unit tests, the links are going to be in the end. And you can also sort of bring it to the next step. And instead of having this as just a unit test, you can also define similar rules as policies and then deploy this policy to your say central company repository and then if you apply these policies uh, you will get 
and try to deploy something that violates them, you will just get an error before the deployment and it will just prevent violation of that policy for all the stacks, all the deployments in your company, for example. So it's, it's quite powerful. You could deploy that policy of having a tag of a specific shape once, and then every time you deploy something from Palumina, you will get this rule enforced for everyone in the company. Um, so a couple of words about how you actually deploy uh, stuff with Palumi. On the developer machine I just showed you, you run your CLI. You have all the credentials on your machine, so you just log in with AZ login, and then we pick it up, and you hopefully have access to your developer environment, and then you can experiment, create resources, delete resources as, as you go, as many times as you want. Now, when you go to production, hopefully you don't do this from developer machine, you check in your Polymer code to your uh, CICD pipeline, and then you have something like uh, Azure DevOps, DevOps or Octopus or whatnot. Uh, we have integrations with a couple of dozens uh, of CICD products, I think. And then you have all the access tokens for Azure somewhere as environment variables in those CICD pipelines. And that CICD integration will run your program from your, on your behalf and deploy resources to production. And then you will get feedback about if something went wrong or not and see all the history and uh, all the typical steps that you have in CICD pipeline, including tests and, and policies. And uh, again, this applies across the landscape. So there are multiple directions in the cloud. There are like compute, uh, storage, application layers, but also things like on, on a different dimension, VMs, containers, serverless, databases. So everything on this diagram can be deployed from the same program or same set of programs at the same time. And uh, a good example of this is uh, very popular these days, Kubernetes. Again, to deploy Kubernetes, you need to create objects on multiple layers. So you have to do the networking and storage first. So that's probably done by your IT people in the organization and probably doesn't change that often. It's done and then sort of exists for, for months and years. And on top of that, you get it in something like AKS, a managed Kubernetes cluster. Again, probably might run by IT folks, uh, operations guys. And then on top of that, you probably use some managed services like Cosmos DB, and you start deploying applications to the cluster. And that's already probably managed by your application teams. So there are multiple layers here. All of them can be deployed with Pulumi, or probably with multiple Pulumi programs because they are changed on different at different time and by different people. So you can imagine there would be a stack. So, so one uh, Polymer pro program is called stack or deployment instance that is only creating networking, another stack that references to that stack and creates an AKS cluster, and another stack that creates an application, another stack that creates another application and deploys that cluster. So that's that's very natural concept also in Polymer. And uh, I, I just want to do a very quick demo before I wrap up of how this code looks like. So I have a sample Kubernetes application here, and uh, I don't have five stacks, but I only have three, I think. Uh, uh, so one stack is called cluster stack, and that's uh, what uh, every, it deploys everything that needs to be deployed for an AKS cluster. It deploys uh, some SSH keys starting from these things like a, a Azure AD application service principles, virtual networks, subnets, AKS cluster, and everything in between. And the result of this execution, after everything is deployed, is going to be a cube config which is exported from the stack, the same way I did for, for the URL. And now, the second stack I have is an application stack, and in this case, I also want to illustrate that you can also deploy YAML files if you have some existing YAML files instead of just deploying your Pulumi objects or even things like Helm charts from the same program. So the, this application stack, it's very simple, but it imports the kubeconfig output from a different stack and then uses that kubeconfig to connect to the cluster and to provision all the resources inside that cluster specifically. So the chart 
component would have an option with the AK, AKS uh, config configured. And these stacks, again, are managed by different people, deployed by different CICD pipelines, probably. So different permissions as well. And that's how you structure your larger applications so, so that it doesn't go too far and doesn't become unmanageable. Um, so that's about it. Just quick, quick conclusions uh, to wrap up. Uh, we think that cloud is still changing the world and it's not done yet. So it's going to be evolving pretty rapidly. And we see more and more enterprises and companies that really embracing it in the cloud native way and creating hundreds or thousands of resources inside their company. And as it grows, it becomes apparent that they need great tools to do that. And Pulumi is one, it's developer friendly, so it aims to bring developers and operations uh, to the same sort of level and uh, start make them talk to each other and use the same set of tools. You can create high level abstractions, reusable abstractions that you can deploy in your company or like take from GitHub or NuGet or NPM and use someone else's best practices uh, in your applications. And also you can more easily test your code and apply best practices from application development world to also infrastructure deployment. Uh, finally, just, just to give you a sense of what, what kind of usage we see a lot. So first, as I said, using doing uh, architecture as code, so bringing developer skills and the developer patterns to your infrastructure definitions. Well, when you share the common approaches, sharing libraries uh, with the community or within the company. Second, a lot of larger enterprises have what they call platform teams, where these platform teams create some pre-built bricks for the, for other application teams. So they uh, sort of restrict them to more constrained uh, set of deployments and then provide these bricks to application developers who could then use those things to deploy some stuff in Azure or to Kubernetes. And those platform teams benefit a lot from having full power of general, general purpose programming languages to define those building blocks for, for their teams. And also uh, companies like, sorry, say CockroachDB, which are SaaS on their own. And every time they have a new customer, they need to provision a bunch of resources in Azure. So every time there is a new CockroachDB installation, somebody runs, well, automation runs a Pulumi script which would create resources for that tenant separately in their uh, cloud account. And that's another, you can imagine they have like hundreds or thousands of stacks, stack deployments. And once you get to that scale, it's it's really hard to do this with uh, more traditional tools. So if you are interested in this, there is just one link that will give you all the resources. If you just uh, go to that bit.ly Pulumi links, you will get the slides, but also uh, links to blog posts that I showed and uh, my Twitter website and some uh, great pages related to this. Uh, so if you have questions uh, anytime later, feel free to reach out to me. Or there is also a community, community Slack. There are like 2,000 people there. So you can go and ask your questions as well. And uh, with this, thanks a lot for, for staying late. Uh, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the union. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Awesome. Thank you so very much. That was a great session. Um, does anybody get any questions? Please do take advantage of our speakers and grill them. <laughs> I haven't checked the chat, so I'm not sure if there were any questions there. Um, nothing in the chat at the moment. Okay. Thanks for pasting the link. It's okay. Anybody get any questions at all for Derek or Mikhail at all? Are we all good? All understood everything that they said. <laughs> cool. 
I'm going to take your silence as everything was okay. But obviously the guys have given their contact details out as well. You can find them on Twitter, um, etc. So if you have any questions, please do reach out to them. I'm sure they'll be um, willing to speak to you offline if you want to do that as well. Um, in the agenda tonight, we do have some time baked in for a kind of round the table if anybody wants to talk about anything. Um, but I'm guessing as everybody is really quiet tonight, maybe that's not something that you want to do. Um, if there's anything you do want to ask anybody um, in the audience, obviously there's a, a bunch of us here tonight, um, please do reach out. Um, um, what we usually do uh, if you've been at our meetings before is we have a quiz uh, to round off the meetup. Um, and there is a quiz prize. So we've got a Logitech mouse and a mouse map that will ship to the, the winner of the quiz. So it is um, worthwhile having a go. Let me share my screen and set this up. But like I said, if there's any questions or any chat you want to do, please do feel free to jump off mute. So our quiz is run on Kahoot. So um, I'm sure most of you have probably played this now, but if you haven't, what to do is get your another a browser open or your mobile phone um, and go to um, kahoot.it and enter the pin. Um, what we'll do is the questions will be on screen and you'll get um, a bunch of options for that question. Each um, option for the question will um, be associated to a colour and on your screen, if you're doing it on your mobile phone, what is, you'll see is, is those four colours or three colours um, relating to the options of that are on screen and you get points for being correct with your answer and also answering the quickest. So it's about speed and accuracy, the quiz. Um, so yeah, um, I'll give everybody a few minutes to join in and then we can kick off and, and start and test your knowledge on, on the quiz. We've got a good number of people um, taking part in the quiz. Is there anybody still trying to join or are we good to kick off? Let me know in the chat or come off mute. I see Alex in the message saying he's just started on the whiskey, so it's not appropriate time, but yeah. <laughs> Everybody good to go with the quiz? We all good? I'm going to kick off if we are. I'll take the silence as a yes. Cool. Let's kick off the quiz tonight then. So like I said, the question and the options for your answer will appear on screen here and the way you answer is on your phone. So what is Pulumi an example of? Is it an operating system, um, infrastructure as code, cheese, um, or is it a Hollywood movie? And yep, that's correct. It is infrastructure as code. Cool, good leaderboard. Next question. And this is for double points. What was a new feature released in Azure Security Center recently? Was it the freshness interval, cyber block, cost savings or remote lock? So it was the freshness interval um, and that's a bit of a weird name, but what that basically is, is it gives you a little dialogue box that shows you in the recommendations how often we actually refresh that in the Azure portal. So 
if you've got an alert within security center that says you've got port 3389 open on a virtual machine and then you remediate that by blocking that port and um, it will show you how often that takes to refresh so sometimes it can be 30 minutes before that that notification will actually go away others take 24 hours to um, update so what we've now added in is the ability to see when that update um, goes away so you know if your changes worked or not So yep, that totally changed the leaderboard. So a true or false here. LRI, LRS stands for locally redundant storage in Azure. Is that true or false? And yep, that is true. Oh. So another quiz question. What does RBAC stand for in Azure? Is it really bad at cloud? role-based access control or really bad air conditioning? And yep, that was an easy one. That is role-based access control. Cool. Fifth question. And again, this is for double points. What is the new Azure AI exam code? Is it AI100, AZ900, AI900 or AZ000? And yep, the new um, Azure AI Fundamentals exam is actually AI 900. Um, and I took that a few weeks ago and we definitely recommend it. Um, some of the learning materials we have for that exam are actually quite good and it covered off a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't know that we actually had for AI in Azure. Oh, that totally changed the leaderboard there. So another true or false. Octopus Deploy can help you automate the release of your application deployments. And it's true. I'm glad you were all paying attention to Derek earlier on. OK, number seven. How many Azure regions are there? Are there 50, 55, 56 or 57? Now, I did sit and count this, so hopefully I've got the right number. And yeah, um, at the moment we have 57, or at least the last, when I um, did this quiz earlier on, we had 57 regions. So yeah, that's changed the leaderboard a bit. Question number eight, when did the UK Azure data centers opened? Was it 2009, 2010, 2016 or 2019? So when did they open the UK Azure data centers? And yep, it was in 2016 that we actually opened them. Both of them were opened in 2016. Oh, bit of a shift. So another double points question. What was Windows 95 codename? Was it Memphis, Chicago, Longhorn or Whistler? And yep, its code name was actually Chicago um, and Windows 95 actually celebrated 25 years of being out and available this week. So um, well done to those paying attention to that one. Total change of the leaderboard there. Let's see, question 10. Which of the following services are part of the artificial intelligence service in Azure? Is it HD Insight, Azure Machine Learning Service, Azure Dev Test Labs or Azure Advisor? And yep, Azure Machine Learning is part of our AI service in Azure. Oh, got a good contest going on here. And last question, true or false? All the resources deployed to a single resource group must share the same Azure region. Is that true or false? And yep, that's false. Um, you can have them anywhere you want. <laughs> So let's see what the podium looks like tonight. In third place, we have Gordo D. In second place, we have Aidan Hammond. And in first place, our winner tonight is Alistair L. <laughs> well done, Alistair. Thank you for taking part, everybody. Um, it was good fun to um, take part in that little quiz tonight.
Um, thank you to everybody that came along and supported the meetup tonight. Um, Alistair, if you want to reach out to me um, in the chat window or if you want to ping me, I'll put my email address um, in the chat box and we can get your prize to you. But um, again, thank you to everybody that came along and supported the meetup. Um, our next meetup is scheduled for the 28th of October. Um, it's probably looking like we might be virtual with that again, unfortunately, with current situation. But if anything changes and it's safe to maybe do an in-person event, then we'll, we'll definitely look at that. Um, but do look out for details of our next meetup, save it in the diary. Um, and again, thank you everybody um, for attending and thank you to our amazing speaker as well.